Hi everyone, this is Sarah Russell, and today I, I, want, to do, I want to do something a little bit different from my usual um, kind of theme and, and style in, uh, in videos. Um, I want to bring together two different worlds, which are um, today's kind of health situation, in, and in particular, the, the coronavirus, um, co the COVID-19, um, issue that has definitely concerned a lot of people worldwide um, with medieval literature of all things. So I'm going to be doing a read aloud. It's been a very long time actually since um, since I worked with uh, worked actively and directly with medieval literature. I actually used to be um, an, an instructor at UC Berkeley for um, Italian language literature and called writing courses. So um, I'm going to integrate the, these two worlds together. Um, it, you'll understand why very shortly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from the um, preface that Giovanni Boccaccio wrote to his masterpiece collection of short stories, The Decameron. So I'm going to be reading from the um, Wayne Rebhorn translation. Um, which is what I had lying around my house. Um, so, um, pardon my gaze because I'm looking at my book. Uh, okay, so I'm reading basically from the second page of the, um, of the introduction to day one. Um, this is the voice of Boccaccio who wrote um, around the time of, of, the, of the big um, 1348 to 1352 kind of wave of the Black Death that basically it decimated Europe and the Middle Ages. It um, killed a substantial percentage of the population. Um, I'm not saying this to discourage anybody. Uh, if anything, it should actually make us feel better because we have a lot more scientific knowledge and um, infectious disease experience today than, than, uh, than they did in 1348, as you all definitely um, come to see as I, as I read through some of this text. So, um, he says, let me say then that 1,348 years had passed since the uh, fruitful incarnation of the Son of God when the deadly plague arrived in the noble city of Florence, the most beautiful of any in Italy. Whether it descended on us mortals through the influence of the heavenly bodies or was sent down by God in his righteous anger to chastise us because of our wickedness, it had begun some years before in the East, where it deprived countless beings of their lives before it headed to the West spreading ever greater misery as it moved re relentlessly from place to place. Against it, all human wisdom and foresight were useless. Vast quantities of refuse, refuse were removed from the city by officials charged with this function. The sick were not allowed inside the walls, and numerous instructions were disseminated for the preservation of health, but all to no avail. Nor were humble supplications made to God by the pious, not just once but many times, whether in organized processions or in other ways, any more effective. For practically from the start of spring in the year we mentioned above, the plague began producing its sad effects in a terrifying and extraordinary manner. It did not operate as, if it, as it had done in the East, where if anyone bled through the nose, it was a clear sign of inevitable death. Instead, at its onset, in men and women alike, Certain swellings would develop in the groin or under the armpits, some of which would grow like an ordinary apple and others like an egg, some larger and some smaller. These, um, these would begin to spread from the two areas already mentioned and would appear at random over the rest of the body. Um, then the symptoms of the disease began to change and many people discovered black or livid blotches on their arms, thighs, and every other part of their bodies, sometimes large, and widely scattered, and other times tiny and close together. For whoever contracted them, these spots were a most certain sign of impending death, just as, as the swellings had been earlier and still continued to be. Against these maladies, the advice of doctors and the power of medicine appeared useless and unavailing. Perhaps the nature of the disease was such that no remedy was possible, or the problem lay with those who were treating it, for their number 
which had become enormous, included not just qualified doctors, but women as well as men who had never any training, never had any training in medicine. And since none of them had any idea what was causing the disease, they could hardly prescribe an appropriate remedy for it. Thus, not only were very few people cured, but in almost every case, death occurred within three days after the appearance of the signs we had described, sometimes sooner and sometimes later, and usually without fever or any other complication. Moreover, what made this pestilence all the more virulent was that it was spread by the slightest contact between the sick and the healthy. Just as a fire will catch dry or oily materials when they are placed right beside it. In fact, this evil went even further, for not only did it infect those who merely talked or spent any time with the sick, but it also appeared to transfer the disease to anyone who merely touched the clothes or other objects that had been handled or used by those who were its victims. So he continues to describe um, the situation. By the way, this is not an entirely historically accurate account, um, but many details are supposedly, you know, somewhat historical. The, the process of gathering and telling um, and, and uh, writing down history was actually very different from how it is now. So this is a bit of, you know, history mixing fiction, for sure. Um, so if you're a historian and you're, and you're like, oh, that's not exactly how, how it went down, that's okay. This is fictional history, uh, storytelling, all wrapped into one. Um, okay, so moving forward, he continues to describe the situation, and, um, and, he's, and he then goes on to say, these things and many others like them, or even worse, caused all sorts of fears and fantasies in those who remained alive almost all of whom took one utterly cruel precaution, namely to avoid the sick and their belongings. Fleeing far away from them, for in doing so, they all thought they could preserve their own health. Some people were of the opinion that living moderately and being abstemious would really help them resist the disease. They therefore formed themselves into companies and lived in isolation from everyone else. Having come together, they shut themselves up inside houses where no one was sick and they had ample means to live well, so that while avoiding overindulgence, they still enjoyed the most delicate foods and the best of wines in moderation. They would not speak with anyone from outside, nor did they want to hear any news about the dead and dying, and instead they passed their time playing music and enjoying whatever other amusements they could devise. Others, holding the contrary opinion, maintained that the surest medicine for such an evil disease was to drink heavily, enjoy life's pleasures, and go about singing and having fun satisfying their appetites by any means available while laughing at everything and turning whatever happened into a joke. Moreover, they practiced what they preached to the best of their ability, for they went from one tavern to another, drinking to excess both day and night. They did their drinking more freely in private homes, however, provided that they found something there to enjoy, or that held out the promise of pleasure. Such places were easy to find, because people feeling as though their days were numbered had not just abandoned themselves, but all their possessions, too. Most houses had thus become common property, and any stranger who happened upon them could treat them as if they were his rightful owner, as if he were their rightful owner. And yet, while these people behaved like wild animals, they always took great care to avoid any contact with all the sick. Um, in the midst of so much affliction and misery in our city, the respect for the reverend authority of the laws, both divine and human, had declined just about the vanishing point for, like everyone else, their officers and executors, executors who were not dead or sick themselves had so few personnel that they could not fulfill their duties. Thus, people felt free to behave however they liked. There were many who took a middle course between the two already mentioned, neither restricting their diet so much as the first, nor letting themselves go and drinking and other forms of dissipation so much as the second, but doing just enough to satisfy their appetite. Instead of shutting themselves up, they went about, some carrying flowers in their hands, others with, others with sweet-smelling herbs, and yet others with various kinds of spices. By the way, those of you familiar with the, with the legend behind this thieves' essential oil um, may actually, um, th this may resonate with you. Um, although the stories being told about the origins of the thieves' essential oil are, they have some very anachronistic details talk about at some point. Um, okay, they would repeatedly hold these things up to their noses, 
for they thought the best course was to fortify the brain with such odors against the stinking air that seemed to be saturated with the stench of dead bodies of disease and medicine. Others choosing what may have been the safer alternative cruelly maintained that no medicine was better or more effective against the plague than flight. Convinced by this argument and caring for nothing but themselves, a large number of both men and women abandoned their own city, their own house, homes, their relatives, their properties and possessions, and headed for the countryside, either that lying around, either that lying around Florence, or, or better still, that which was farther away. It was as if they thought that God's wrath, once provoked, did not aim to punish men's iniquities with the plague wherever it might find them, but would strike down only those found inside the walls of their city. Or perhaps they simply concluded that no one in Florence would survive and that the city's last hour had come. Of these people holding, various, holding these varied opinions, not all of them died, but by the same token, not all of them survived. On the contrary, many proponents of each view got sick here, there, and everywhere. Moreover, since they themselves, when they were well, had set the example for those who were not yet infected, they too were almost completely abandoned by everyone as they languished away. And leaving aside the fact that the citizens avoided one another, that almost no one took care of his neighbors and that the relatives visited one another infrequently, if ever, and always kept their distance, the tribulation of the plague had put such fear into the hearts of men and women that brothers abandoned their brothers, uncles their nephews, sisters their brothers, and very often wives their husbands. In fact, what is even worse and almost unbelievable is that fathers and mothers refused to tend to their children and take care of them, treating them as if they belonged to someone else. Consequently, the countless numbers of people who got sick, both men and women, had to depend for help, either on the charity of the few friends they had who were still around, or on the greed of their servants, who would only work for high salaries out of all proportion to the services they provided. For all that, though, there were few servants to be found, and those few tended to the men and women of limited intelligence, most of whom not trained for such duties, with little more then hand sick people the few things they ask for or watch over them as they die. And yet, while performing these services, they themselves often lost their lives along with their wages. As a result of the abandonment of the sick by neighbors, friends, and family, and in light of the scarcity of servants, there, are, there arose a practice hardly ever heard of before, whereby when a woman fell ill, no matter how attractive or beautiful or noble, she did not object to having a man as one of her attendants, a man as one of her attendants, whether he was young or old, indeed, if her infirmity made it necessary, she experienced no more shame in showing him every part of her body than she would have felt with a woman, which was the reason why those women who were cured were perhaps less chaste than the fairy that followed. Moreover, a great many people chanced to die who might have survived if they had had any sort of assistance. In general, between the inadequacy of the means to care for the sick and the virulence of the plague, the number of people dying both by day and by night was so great that it astonished those who merely heard tell of it, let alone those who actually witnessed it. As a result of the plague, it was almost inevitable that practices arose among the citizens who survived that went contrary to their original customs. It used to be the case, as it is again today, that the female relatives and next door neighbors of a dead man would come to his house and mourn there with the women of the household while his male neighbors and a fair number of other citizens would assemble in front of the house with his male relatives. After that, the clergymen would arrive, their number depending on the social rank of the deceased, who would then be carried over the shoulders of his peers and made all the funeral pomp and candles and chants the church he had chosen before his death. As the ferocity of the plague began to increase, such practices all but disappeared in their entirety while other new ones arose to take their place. For people did not just die without women around them, but many departed this life without anyone at all as a witness. And very few of them were accorded the pious lamentations and bitter tears of their families. On the contrary, in place of all the usual weeping, most, mostly there was laughing and joking and festive merrymaking, a practice that women, having largely suppressed their feminine piety, had mastered in the interest of preserving their health. Moreover, there were few whose bodies were accompanied to church by more than 10 or 12 of their neighbors, nor were they carried on the shoulders of their honored and esteemed fellow citizens, but by a band of grave diggers come up um, from the lower classes who insisted on being called sextons and performed their services for a fee. They would shoulder the beard or buyer uh, and quick 
march it off, not to the church that the dead man had chosen before his demise, but in most cases to the one closest by. They would walk behind four or six clergymen who carried just a few candles, and sometimes none at all, and who did not trouble themselves with lengthy solemn burial services, but instead, with the aid of those sextons, dumped the corpse as quickly as they could into whatever empty grave they found. So, um, he goes on saying, um, skipping a couple of lines here, um, confined thus to their neighborhoods, people got sick every day by the thousands and having no servants or anyone else to attend to their needs, they almost very would perish. Many expired out in public streets, both day and night. And although a great many others died inside their houses, the stench of their decaying bodies announced their deaths to their neighbors well before anything else did. And what with these, plus the others who were dying all over the place, the city was overwhelmed with corpses. So I'm not going to go on beyond this. I think you have kind of an idea of what, um, you know, of what is being narrated here. Um, I wanted to actually go back to the very first line of the preface, um, a few pages before the introduction to the first day that I, I just read out of. Um, the first sentence of the Decameron um, is, it is a matter of humanity to show compassion for those who suffer. And although it is fitting for everyone to do so, it is especially desirable in those who, having had need of, need of comfort, have received it from others. And if anyone ever needed it or appreciated it or derived any pleasure from it, I am one of them. So um, long sentence, <laughs> Boccaccio is known for incredibly long sentences. Um, but um, essentially, you know, the, the entire um, collection of stories is framed with this idea of empathy, compassion for our fellow human being and their suffering, putting ourselves in their shoes, understanding, um, you know, the, the pain of the afflicted and, and uh, supporting them through rough times. Now, um, the, the situation of the contagion, uh, the epidemic, is definitely discussed in you know um, descriptive terms and also kind of you know reflective terms um, and some of the details are really interesting because there are today with the with the COVID-19 scare a lot of different approaches and there's a lot of fear one of the things that Okacha talks about in in the introduction um, to today one of the Decameron is this extended fear and the way that it kind of leads to people self-isolating or you know even uh, decrease legal decrees that uh, that impose self-isolation um, and even you know suspended um, um, cultural ceremonies and um, and customs like you know the, the lack of a proper funeral now as as chance has it i live actually uh, about 35 miles out of florence which is the city that Boccaccio describes in the introduction to day one of the Decameron. He was a Florentine, um, although he had, he definitely traveled all over different courts of Italy, so he spent a lot of time in Naples as well. Um, so he's describing uh, the city of Florence um, and, you know, the, the kind of escape of those who could to the countryside. Um, in a time when, um, you know, people tended to think more about themselves than others. Uh, and nobody really knew, you know, what was causing the, the illness, so they didn't know what to do. Uh, so everybody was kind of trying to figure out their own, you know, solution. Uh, the decrees were telling people what to do, but it was very confusing. People were really afraid. Funerals were not going on uh, the way that they are now. Um, families uh, kind of disintegrated. So this is really interesting because today, here in Italy, basically, um, you, you probably have heard it on the news. Uh, we are uh, in a state of uh, everybody is locked down, um, and um, and this comes on kind of at the heels of two months of absolute panic without any direction whatsoever, which is actually fairly surprising for a modern uh, country in the Western world. Um, I heard people talking in, in local cafes for a couple months about you know, um, oh, this is so scary and blah, blah, blah. And yet people were uh, loading up on Tylenol when they had fevers. They were going out doing their daily business, sending sick kids to school, 
loaded up on Tylenol. You know, so they could just go about doing their daily business and they were complaining about the politicians not doing anything. And yet they were not washing their hands when they were coming out of the bathroom. Um, the bathrooms themselves were not clean. So, you know, it's like, where do you start? Start with yourself, <laughs> like wash your hands. Um, so um, I've kind of adopted a motto during all of this, um, which is, which I, it, it's not my motto. I, I read it somewhere and I don't even know where it originated. Um, and it is uh, clean hands, open hearts. And I think that is a very kind of simple illustration of kind of the balance that we should all be looking for. So I really feel very strongly, and this is a paradigm that I have developed in other contexts, actually in my, in my work as a nutritional therapy practitioner, um, but I think it is incredibly relevant to the current um, state of things in, in the COVID-19 world. So this, it, the, the framework or paradigm is a framework of balanced information and empowered action steps. So when, when people don't have those two things, they literally do not know what to do. So the two um, kinds of uh, poles that people are oscillating between right now, and it might be the same person oscillating between the two poles, or there could be just different people, some on one side and some on the other. They are, on the one hand, complete fear with no idea what to do. Like, literally, I know people who were scared of, of Chinese people, and yet they, they were visiting, like literally suppressing their fevers with Tylenol and going to visit, you know, like a, a sick relative in a nursing home that same day. And it's like, but really, do you realize that you could be spreading something? Think about it. Um, so a lot of people just thinking, you know, this is not me. Um, so, in the, so you could actually oscillate within the same day, terrified and having no idea what to do and kind of being in denial at the same time. So that's kind of the other poll that I wanted to talk about, just being in denial, dismissing the problem. So, you know, I've heard a lot of people saying, oh, no, it's not an issue. Um, so I do believe <laughs> that, um, that panic is not the best solution to anything. It just literally is another problem. Panic depresses the immune system. It, it suppresses immune function both directly and indirectly, and it's actually very bad for individuals, families, and societies, for sure. Um, however, that does, the fact that panic is, is not the best approach does not mean that the problem doesn't exist and shouldn't be addressed. So I really think that it is important to find a balanced perspective. It definitely was not found in the first two months since the news broke here in Italy. Uh, people were traveling for leisure to and from Italy, and I'm sure, you know, uh, and of course, you know, other countries. Uh, so the this has been has gone from being kind of, you know, initially localized epidemic in one area to being a global pandemic in a way, uh, or almost a global pandemic, because it, people did not understand that, um, that, that there was a need to um, curb travel, <laughs> for example. I'm not judging you if, if you traveled. Um, you know, definitely um, the, the time when, when the news broke is the time that um, you know, a lot of people I know travel to an annual conference I, that I would have liked to be at. <laughs> I didn't go to it. Um, but, you know, um, I might have in, under different circumstances. So I'm not judging anybody. So if, if you're hearing this, please do not feel judged whatsoever. I'm just talking about kind of the collective, um, you know, sort of turning down the volume on reality. It's normal. It's totally normal. And to, to some extent, it may even be healthy. So I'm totally not judging you. If, if you are in the, I traveled during this time period count. I definitely am in, in the, you know, I did some things at some point, you know, at some points that retrospectively, you know, why did I do that? Um, um, so, you know, um, we, and most adults, I, I read the statistic, touch their, their nose or eyes like 16 times in an hour <laughs> and kids like upwards of 50 times in and out. So that is like, we all have habits and ways of thinking and, you know, things like that that are subconscious and that drive us. And, you know, so this is not about judgment whatsoever. I'm just talking about global public policy and awareness issues from a bigger, not like individual perspective. Um, so, you know, like a, a lot of this was just spread by tourism. And I'm like, you know, why are cruise ships even in operation right now? I just don't understand. Um, but, you know, that's just me. Um, Anyway, so um, over here, we are literally all in lockdown. And not only have funeral services um, really been cut down, they have totally been eliminated. 
So there are people who have relatives who have died of COVID-19 in Italian hospitals who, um, whose, whose family were not allowed to even tell them goodbye. You know, sons and daughters were not able to say goodbye to, to their mom or dad in the hospital before, uh, before they deceased, uh, before they died. And then afterwards, there, there are no funerals. Funerals have been banned. Weddings have been banned. Everything has been banned. Uh, school has been banned. Um, and this is literally like a couple weeks after, you know, teachers maybe have been doing international travel on behalf of the schools and visiting other schools and doing all kinds of stuff and not even isolating before they come back. And the school never even asking them to isolate or to be careful or even wash their hands. Like we went literally from one day where everybody was just indiscriminately going all over the place and there were no like hand washing policies and no public health measures and nothing and to okay school is canceled for the next 10 days and then it became a whole month and now we don't even know how long it's going to be canceled for and um and then you know what happened the first day after school was canceled because of the covid epidemic the families families flocked in mass to ski resorts um, adolescents were just all over the, the public squares they were in cafes um, just with no awareness and I'm, I'm not judging anybody please you know, if you're a parent if you're a kid like literally you should not feel judged I'm just saying it's normal for people to congregate people had no awareness that this could potentially not be a good idea just like people had no idea when they had fevers like just literally a couple weeks ago, the same people who were worried, listening to the news every day, watching the news on TV, reading the newspapers, they were in a panic about COVID-19. They were still suppressing their fevers or their kids' fevers, going about their daily business, not thinking about this potentially being a problem. Um, and the other issue that is really huge that most people just literally have not really honed in on is that the vast majority, and this is what makes COVID-19 so incredibly insidious, um, and virulent is that unlike the Black Death that literally like almost everybody caught and many people died from, um, if people got evidently sick and they died within a few days, this is different because the vast majority of people who, um, who have the COVID virus in their body have no symptoms. They will have no symptoms, no symptoms for the entire duration of the disease. So, um, you know, like um, you could be sick with COVID, um, and you could spread it being sick if you do not isolate. Uh, you could also not be sick, have it and spread it indiscriminately without having any idea whatsoever. Now, obviously it's not your fault um, if you don't know that you have it. So this is why people are currently being put on lockdown. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure that, um, that prohibiting, um, you know, that, that basically banning um, all kinds, of, all forms of, um, of socialization and community is really in the long term going to be supportive. You know, how many weeks um, can elderly people in, in uh, rest homes um, live without, you know, without their family coming and visiting them? I mean, that is, it's dramatic. Where do we find the balance? Um, what does it mean to, you know, for somebody to lose their parent? their elderly parent who just died of, of a serious infection in a hospital and not be able to say goodbye in a funeral. I mean, we have rituals. My son is, is eight and a half. He's studying um, human history. The, if I remember correctly, <laughs> because uh, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we read through his unit together recently, um, human beings started, doing, uh, started having rituals and burials around death around 30,000 years ago. So we have had rituals around burying the dead and honoring the dead for 30,000 years. This is in our DNA. Um, you can't just eliminate that like from one day to the next. We still need this closure when people die. So where do we find a balance? I'm not criticizing you know, anybody, obviously. Um, you know, Individuals are collective. I'm just saying we are in a very dramatic place right now. What does it mean to be human right now? What does it mean to have communities? What does it mean to protect our communities? Um, you know, so as a person who has um, a health condition that causes um, occasional um, kind of recurring immunosuppression, um, I've, I've thought about these things a lot. Um, and, um, and so this is definitely part of kind of my uh, framework of, um, you know, 
of, of action and, um, and thinking as, as an individual, but also as a, as a practitioner working with complex health cases. So I, I have a lot of questions right now, and I, I, I will be continuing this series. I, I don't know with what regularity, because I am literally on lockdown and at home. I do not have um, a sufficiently strong internet connection to be able to record videos from home. So I will be sporadically uh, you know, leaving my house uh, with the correct official papers to come to, uh, to the rented office space that I have. Uh, in a now fully deserted community center and cafe, which you know, but it's completely locked down except for my my room, um, and um, and do you know doing this work? This is also where I get my client consultations from. So yes, if you are a client or a prospective client, I am continuing to work through this, um, and I, I I am available to do uh, consultations specifically on this uh, on the topic of the of the COVID um, nineteen um, epidemic. You know, kind of what you can do. Um, on a bio-individual basis, based on your particular health situation, um, if you're looking to, to lower your prevention, you know, to, to lower your uh, your chances of getting this, you know, finding the right balance. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm not a doctor; I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, so I can help you, uh, you know, come up with questions to ask your medical provider. I do not; my work does not in any way substitute the work of your licensed medical practitioner. So, you know, um, any nutritional recommendations I make are in um, are complementary to the medical care that you receive, obviously. So, um, so that's my disclaimer there on that. Um, so anyway, uh, I do hope that we'll talk soon. Uh, if you have any questions and, and continue to stay tuned because I will be posting more, I'm sure, in, in the next days and weeks. Thank you so much. Bye.